So I would like to start this session by asking a question. How many of you have ever traveled with a pocket map? Please raise your hands. OK. Um, how many of you have know the connection be between these two objects? <laughs> Please raise your hands. OK. I'm glad that nobody has insulted us with their youth. OK. Um, how many of you have ever made use of a typewriter? OK, most of you, I would say. So, and now we're all using a, smart, a smartphone, right? B between a typewriter and a smartphone, there is a whole collection of technological changes. But technological changes don't come alone. They come hand in hand with social changes, political changes, changes in business models, changes in means of communication. I think it is not too bold to say that we are, all of us here today, the generation that has been exposed to the highest level of change in history. No generation has ever been asked to learn so many things in so little time. That's our generation. And uh, in a generous approach, I would say we, all of us here belong to the bridge generation, which is that, that generation that crossed from the analog world to the digital one. And there are many challenges in this crossing. But business-wise, one of the key challenges that we have is identifying the right strategy for our companies and for our industries in this very moment we are living through. This is a matrix that I would like to use to, to try to identify with you what's the right strategy nowadays in the media industry. It has two variables, stable and unstable, high competition and low competition, as you see. A market is stable when the rules of the game don't change significantly. The way of competing nowadays is as 10 years ago, and in five year time, it's going to be the same. So that's not change, that's stable market. But a market gets unstable when there are different factors that change the rules of the game. Typically, there are three factors that change the rules of the game in a specific market. The first one would be um, regulation. Some little changes in regulation, especially in industries like pharma industry or telecommunication sector or the energy sector, those little changes can be pretty disruptive for the whole industry. So regulation is one of those factors that change the rules of the game. The second factor could be technology. As soon as new technological developments are known by the market, it's easier to develop new business models that can be disruptive for the traditional players. So technology is another factor that creates instability. And finally, the behavior of demand. demand as soon as consumers have more, tool, uh, more tools and more information about the market and about the different alternatives, it gets easier for the demand to move from one place to the other. So if you foresee changes, or if you just see now changes in regulation, in technology, and in demand in this market, you would say that you are in an unstable situation. Uh, high competition doesn't necessarily mean that you have many competitors. Maybe you have just a few of them, but they are struggling as you are struggling. So you feel the competition. So I would like you, if you have something to write down, uh, to draw these little metrics and identify what's the right position uh, for the media industry. And you have to choose between a stable or unstable high competition and low competition. Take a minute to do so. And then we can review how many of you think that the media industry is in a high competition and a stable situation. That means that the rules of the game are changing. The way of competing today is as 10 years ago, and in five years' time, it's going to be the same. How many of you would raise your hand for that position up there in that corner? Over there. Stable and high competition. No hands? OK. A stable and low competition? All right. Let's move to the unstable side. Low competition and unstable. And finally, OK, all of you. Uh, that was my guess. Uh, so that's why I put the cross over there. <laughs> to be honest, I haven't changed it in 10 years in different countries and different industries, because all of us are going through a nightmare of change lately. So what's the right strategy depending on this situation? Let's review different positions according to uh, strategy books, let's say. In high competition markets, but stable, it makes sense to focus on better results, on performing your business model better than the competition. 
the rules of the, in the game are unchanging, so try to perform better than the others. If you move down to a stable and low competition, it could be interesting to focus on reducing costs. It's a more internal approach since uh, you are not worried about the competitions. Of course, these strategies are not exclusionary. They are complementary. But uh, th those are the main parts of the strategy. On the instability side, we have redesigning processes and a, as a right strategy to get ready for big changes coming ahead. The way you operate, the way you relate to customers, the way you organize yourself, in many ways you need to redesign processes. And finally, what will be the right strategy in a high competition and a stable market? Innovation. It's, it's pretty obvious. We need to innovate. That's what the market is asking us to do. So on leading innovation, what we feel nowadays is we are like in the middle of a global storm. And where you, when you are in a global storm, you need to pay attention especially to two dimensions. The first one is understanding the context. How high are the waves? How strong are the winds? Or where do they come from? And I think at this past financial times is particularly good, understanding the context and explaining the context to global leaders all over the world. But the other dimension is critical. Do I have the leadership to lead in turbulent times? Do I have the skill set to be in the middle of a transformation? Because when you are in the middle of a transformation, your management skills maybe, maybe are not enough for this situation. So you need to develop personal and organizational capabilities according to this situation. So to put in black and white, no, nowadays there is no lack of managers. There are many of them. There's plenty of managers. It's lack of leaders with the capacity to transform, to transform. And the capacity to transform could be defined in many ways, but I would say there are four dimensions in being able to transform. The first dimension of the capacity to transform is the capacity to reinvent a business model that is declining somehow. Not only to talk and to know the best trends in your industry, but to be able to disrupt even your own business model that is one of the key dimensions of the capacity to transform. The second would be the capacity to redesign processes that involve many people, and not only on a piece of paper, which is relatively easy, but also in reality. And here is the third dimension, re-enthusing people to embrace that new process, which is not that easy, as you probably have experienced. So that capacity of re-enthusing people to embrace a new way of doing things. And finally, I would say, the capacity to transform is the capacity to fix or to, I would say, those com pending conversations that we have, those relationships that are, are broken, we need to fix those relationships. So that capacity to connect with people, to reconnect with people, and sometimes look around, we all have conflicts in our lives, in our families, in our social context, in our team, maybe in our company. So we need to restore damaged relationships all around us. And the thing is that this capacity to transform we are talking about is not only a capacity that you have to, you need to have. The whole organization needs to develop this capacity. So that's why we need a culture of collaboration in our companies in order to, to be prepared as a collective as a, as a group of people to for, be ready for these changes that are coming ahead. I think we shouldn't take collaboration for granted. We talk about collaboration very often, but uh, we shouldn't take it for granted, as we can see in this picture. Hey, your side of the boat is sinking. Some people say so, right? This is typical in companies. Eh? Come on, if we are all going to sink, what's the point in blaming each other? But this is precisely what we tend to do in organizations. So I would like to focus a little bit on collaboration and how can we develop collaboration in our particular organization and in our team. And again, I think collaboration has two dimensions, critical dimensions, trust and discipline. Let me define trust like that kind of relationship that you achieve with someone. You've been working him with him or her for so long that the type of relationship that you have with that colleague is like I mean, you are friends. You might consider him or her 
a brother or a sister. So that's really high trust among people. And what is low trust? It sounds like, you know, here in this company, you need to arrive breakfasted and cried. So don't tell me your problems, get your job done, and then go home. You know, we are here to work. We are professionals. Don't tell me your personal stuff. That kind of thing. That's really old, but uh, somehow you can find some, this kind of atmosphere, depending on the leadership of your boss. You can have this feeling of nobody cares. Yes. Get your job done. Then we have discipline. And I would summarize discipline as this quality that is keeping things, time, information, and ideas um, on the right place, in order. So if we cross these two dimensions, trust and discipline, we get four degrees of collaboration. The first one would be defensive collaboration which sounds like, I did my job, but you didn't. So if we don't get this project on time, it will be your fault. That kind of collaboration is not very promising if we need to transform something to have this kind of relationship on a team. Um, we can get technical collaboration if we have high discipline, which is very often found in multinationals in the Anglo-Saxon world. You tend to have uh, discipline in companies because you're good at setting up rules, and people tend to follow the rules. If, because if you don't follow the rules, you get fired, basically. So that's, that's a way of dealing with it. So people tend to follow the rules, and this model of collaboration works in a stable situation, I would say. But whenever you need to come to change something, to come up with new ideas, to arouse the enthusiasm of your team, this level of collaboration doesn't reach. It's not enough for the challenges that you are dealing with. So if we move to the other corner, we are basically in the Latin world in which we tend to, to have a higher level of trust. People are more often more um, uh, open, and they trust each other, and they are more warm, if you want. But uh, the problem in the Latin world as a culture is that uh, we are not very disciplined. And when you are not very disciplined, the problem and the consequence is you cannot implement your own ideas. So you move on the blah, 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 basically. So finally, we, here we have the goal reaching this flow, which is a totally different level of collaboration based on high trust and high discipline. And when you see a team working this way with that level of trust and this level of discipline, you can see amazing things. And this idea of flow leads us to the concept of synergy, which is, which is critical and which I would like to illustrate with a story that happens to me a number of years ago. When I was driving with some friends, an old Land Rover by the ocean in the south of Spain, and then we suddenly got stuck in the middle of this, the beach because uh, the sun was really wet. Somebody told us, if we get salt water in, into the engine, it's going, going to be the end of the Land Rover. So we need to leave this place as soon as possible. OK. So we went out, and we were looking for help. And finally, we found a car. We set up a tow. And at the count of three, we both accelerated. It didn't work. It wasn't enough. So the time was going up, and then uh, Luckily, we found another car, so we set up another tow. And at the count of three, we accelerated. And it didn't work either. So the second driver came out of the car and said, listen, we had a problem here. All right, we know that. Do you have any solution? Yeah, it looks like we are pulling in the same direction, but it, there is a slight difference. And we told him, don't preach us on physics. Come on, tell us what the heck we can do to get out of here. Mm -hmm. So he said, put the cars in line. We put the cars in line, and at the count of three, the ocean was touching the Land Rover already. At the count of three, we accelerated. Immediately, at the very first moment, the three cars came out. I have to admit that I didn't articulate any thought on leadership at that moment. I was only happy of not having to pay a uh, Land Rover that wasn't ours. But thinking about the importance of unity and alignment in teams, and especially in management teams, I found this story relevant. Because many times we all say, 
I'm working so hard for this team. I'm doing my best. And the other person says the same, and the other one. But the reality is that we are disaligned. <laughs> and that lack of alignment is not only preventing us from moving forward, it's preventing us from moving at all. And there is nothing more frustrating than making a big effort and not going anywhere. And this is the reality in many teams. People working hard, moving anywhere. So this idea of alignment is not a, it's not a silly thing. It's critical, especially in management teams. But going back to trust, which is one of the dimensions that is critical and on leading people, on, on leading innovation. I found interesting this quote from Jim Burke, former CEO of Johnson & Johnson. There is no human relationship that works without trust, whether it is a marriage, a friendship, or a company. And I found this really interesting, and I fully agree. But if we want to develop trust in people, we need to be able to work and to collaborate and to go even hand in hand with people whose ideas, whose personality, even his or her political views are different to ours. We need to be able to work and to collaborate with very different people to ours. And that is not an easy task. And we are all probably trying to do so. But uh, we are trying to do so in a world that is complex, that is uh, changing constantly and in many dimensions, as we can see in this chart that I found the other day, which is kind of overwhelming how many things are happening at the same time in just in 60 seconds. But look at only through email and WhatsApp, nearly 170 million messages are sent every 60 seconds. And my intuition is that behind many of these messages are face-to-face -face conversations that we should have held, you and I. This amazing connectivity we're enjoying since last decade is formidable in many ways. But it's also creating an epidemic side effect. When face-to-face -face conversations are needed to tackle problems, to innovate, to broach difficult situations, we, you and I, are hiding instead behind a keyboard and a screen, shooting emails from the distance like a hidden sniper. And this tendency to replace face-to-face -face conversations with emails and messages is creating conflicts among professionals. You are probably familiar with the idea of stabbing 2.0, <laughs> which is a digital way to stab someone in the back, right? So, there are all sorts of conflicts among us because we don't broach those pending conversations and we don't talk to each other face to face. Um, and there is also a growing inefficiency in our, in our organizations because uh, we spend most of our time just dealing with messages, written messages that could have been avoided by a single and quick conversation. So if you let me propose a slogan, a new slogan for the team, for your team, or maybe for the company, would be less email and more conversations. And I think there is much at the stake on this shift, since the quality of your leadership depends on the quality of your conversations. Think about it. Think about your leadership in terms of conversations. What do your colleagues, family members, friends, think about the way you converse. How are your conversations? Are they inspiring? <coughs> well, you probably remember this story that happens in January 2009, this plane that landed in the Hudson River. That plane took off from LaGuardia Airport. And as soon as they took off, a flock of migratory birds entered in both engines, resulting in a rapid loss of power. The pilot called the base and said, I need to land right now. And they told him, the closest place you can land is six minutes from your position. 
he realizes that he can't make it. So he takes a very strong decision from the leadership standpoint, which is to land in the Huston River. Another story told by someone that was sitting on the first row of that plane, that two years later, told in a video what happens to him in those two minutes, he thought were the last two minutes of his life. He was sitting there, he felt the impact of something in the engines, and suddenly he heard something through the speakers. The pilot said, we're heading to the Hudson, fasten your seat belts, and prepare for impact. So he thought, we are all going to die, basically. I mean, this, this, is, this idea of landing in the Hudson River is not very useful, right? So at that moment, this man couldn't articulate any thought. But there was something in his inner conversation that was telling him, you're not ready to die, if one can ever be ready to die. Because there are three dimensions in my life that don't work at all. The first one is constant discussions with my wife. The second is spending too much time in the office, not because I have too much work, so much work. It's because my family life is frustrating to me. And finally, I'm seeing my children more time with their eyes closed than with their eyes opened. My life is a mess. I need to fix this before I die. And thank God, nobody died. They landed in the Hudson River. But when this man got home that very night, he broached a pending conversation with his wife. And we were able to fix the relationship. And the time he was spending in the office and the quality time he was dedicating to their children. So this man went through a critical transformation through an extraordinary circumstance. And I don't want to diminish this achievement, but achieving an extraordinary change through ordinary situations is way more difficult. So that's why in companies and in families and in society, we all need to master the art of creating these powerful conversations, these extraordinary moments in which we are able to change the reality, not just to manage it. We are able to transform things through conversations. So in case you have any pending conversation, and we are living so fast that uh, we all may have some pending conversations in our lives, let me offer you a new chart to design high impact conversations. Of all the variables at the stake in a conversation, I think there are two critical. One is the capacity that we have to design a good line of argument, solid, clear, with key messages, not too many, backed up with fact and data. And then there is empathy. Empathy is that dimension that uh, allows some people to be able to read someone else's mind or feelings and to identify the right words to express their ideas. So there are people very good at designing strong line of arguments. And there are people who are good at creating empathy. What is difficult to find is people with both qualities. Well, we're all trying to achieve so, right? But the effect of the conversation depends critically on these two dimensions. So when the line of argument is not well structured, is that conversation hasn't been prepared well, and there is lack of empathy between the interlocutors, the effect of the conversation is normally frustration. <coughs> so after that conversation, you feel like, you know, I could have avoided this conversation because the effect of the conversation was even worse. So the size of the problem after the conversation is bigger. You know, you know what happens with this person. You can talk to him or her. I think everything is going to be by email from now on. Mm -hmm. And this is very risky. Because when I say, with this person, everything by email, what I'm saying is, this person is not going to change. And when I say, this person is not going to change, what I'm saying is, I am not going to change. So we are losing faith in the transformational capacity of any human being. So it is critical to identify a different approach when we find these difficult 
relationships. So we need to design a better conversation. What happens when we have a good line of argument, because we are good at that, and there are key messages, very well designed, but the tone of the conversation is that I feel in possession of the truth, and I don't give you any room to participate in the conversation. The only participation that I want from you is, yes, sir. If, if we call that a conversation, which is not, then we get this rejection. It's funny because many super smart people with uh, low empathy, I would say they are kind of um, illiterate in, in terms of uh, emotions, right? So these people don't understand why they don't sell their messages. And many times it's because of the tone they use in the conversation. They create rejection. On the other corner, we have explosive conversations. And that happens when there are many emotions and feelings there in the conversation. But there is lack of structure and key messages. So sometimes the effect is very negative, And it could create conflict among people. There are many broken relationships out of these frustrating conversations in families, in teams, in societies. Um, but there also could be a positive side on the explosive conversation. But its, it's effect is kind of transient, like a summer storm, because there are not good arguments behind those feelings. So anyway, we, my suggestion is we try to develop these inspiring conversations. Inspiring conversations are powerful because they can really change reality. They can reshape the relationship that we have with someone or the problematic situation we are dealing with. But the question is, do I consider myself an inspiring person? Am I inspiring? The way I converse is inspiring to others? Let's define inspir inspiration or the capacity to inspire First of all, by saying that to be inspiring is not to occasionally dazzle someone like a deer caught in the headlights. We all can dazzle people because we are so smart, so articulated, or we think so we are so. But uh, dazzling is one thing. Inspiring is a totally different thing. Inspiring someone requires that you are able to change that person, to move that person to change their habits, and transform who they are. That's a totally different thing. So in case you have pending conversations, let me suggest just a few tips on how to improve the line of argument and how to improve the empathy to broach those conversations. To improve the argument, I would suggest, first of all, to identify the real purpose of the conversation. And the real purpose shouldn't be just to fight back when someone has fought. You need to identify something higher than that, like I need to reshape, to restore this damaged relationship. That would be a reasonable purpose for a conversation on a difficult situation. Second, design the key messages. Not many, just a few, but pow powerful messages and convincing. And design those messages, like two or three, according to the purpose of the conversation. And in the third place, back them up with facts and data. So that's a critical part of having a good line of argument in a conversation. Not many facts and data, just a few, but powerful. And choosing those facts and data is critical. It's a strategic decision. And in order to improve the, <coughs> the way we connect with others and develop empathy, let me suggest, first of all, to change your inner conversation, that conversation that you're having with yourself. And when there is conflict, you are sort of killing the other person in your inner conversation. And you cannot broach an inspiring conversation from that <coughs> mood. So my suggestion, if you feel that tension with the other person, call for a, sun, uh, a snowstorm that washes away that tension and allows you to look at the other person with a different approach, with a different angle giving that person the possibility to, to, to change, and giving that person the credit of being right somehow from their perspective. Secondly, avoid interruptions. It's a very silly way to, say, to tell somebody, I'm not interested in your point of view. And if 
you tell somebody three times in a conversation, I'm not interested in the poetry review, you can, you can imagine the outcome of that conversation. So avoid interruptions and listen with your eyes. It's not that I'm listening, no, you are not showing that you are listening. You need to listen with your eyes, which is a different way of listening. It's really trying to understand the other person's point of view. And finally, when there is conflict, especially when there is conflict, advance as long, for as long as possible on common ground. And only leave common ground when you need to fix something, but go back to common ground. If you start dealing with the critical aspects of the conversation, that's not very promising. So try to advance on common ground. Of course, these are just a few tips. Conversations are a very challenging uh, tool, I would say, that we all have and we probably use not enough. So this is just a few tips, but I would like to finish this session by telling you a story that happens to me. Actually, it didn't happen to me, it happened to my father. He told me recently that when he was 20-something years old, he landed with a German plane in the middle of Seville, the city in the south of Spain. And I told him, Dad, you have to tell me that story. So he was a pilot. They were in a base. Somebody arrived one day saying, who wants to try this new German plane? My father said, I will. And then they explained, you know, this plane has this little problem. Sometimes in the middle of the flight, the engine stops. OK. <laughs> But there is a lever here. You see this lever. You push it back and forth, and then the engine restarts. OK, I can do that. So my father took the plane. He was flying. It was summertime, probably 4 PM. People were asleep in siesta, most likely. And then the engine was working well, actually. But suddenly, my father saw this big avenue at the heart of the city, empty. No cars were driving. So he said, this is a unique opportunity to land here. So he himself stopped the engine, and smoothly against the wind, he landed. He called the base and said, I had an emergency landing. And they sent a truck to bring the plane back to the, to the base. So when the mechanic arrived um, with the truck, my father, and they were dissembling the wings to put the plane on the truck, my father said, what is this lever for? And the mechanic said, don't worry about it. I really want to know. OK, don't tell anybody, right? I won't. You see this lever, there is a cable, follow the cable. And my father followed the cable, and it wasn't connected to the engine at all. It was connected to a little spring attached to the fuselage. So my father said, what is this? And then the mechanic said, listen, let me explain. I told you that this plane, sometimes, we don't know why, but the engine stops. But the fact of the matter is that a few seconds later, the engine restarts. So you don't have to do anything. But to avoid pilots jumping with the parachute at the, the plane crashing, we give you this lever to keep you entertained, right? <laughs> so what's the, that was the engineering of the 50s, I suppose. When my father told me the story, I got two conclusions. The first one, now I understand why my father has been always be so, un so understanding with, her children because, uh, with his children, because when you have such a past, you tend to be more understanding, right? <laughs> but the second lesson that I draw from this story that my fa father told me is that Life is way more interesting when we are daring and we take risks. Because when we take risks, we get to learn more and faster. My father got to learn something really critical at that point, at that moment. So right now, we are living in turbulent times for this industry and for many other industries. We need to be daring. And we probably should start be daring to fix those relationships that we have around in our family, social context, in our company, to be able to develop that trust that allows us to collaborate in the way that is required to live in turbulent times. So we can start changing the world by broaching pending conversations. So let me finish with a daring proposal as well. The daring proposal is choose of pending conversations that you have. Maybe with a with a boss that you secretly despise, or with uh, a colleague that, uh, that is demotivated, or with a friend of yours that is into trouble, or 
with a brother of yours that you've lost contact with a long time ago. Or maybe with the person that you used to love and from whom now you don't expect more than a bearable relationship. Choose a pending conversation and transform it into an inspiring one. Thank you very much.